Before I start our second reading today, we need some context for this reading. This reading from Acts comes in the second volume of the evangelist Luke's tracing first of the life of Christ in the book of Luke, and second, the developments of the early church in the book of Acts. In Acts, Luke traces travels of the apostles by which the Spirit of God is spread or revealed to the whole Roman Empire. Among the narratives in 28 sermons, I'm sure you've counted them, and other speeches in Acts is today's reading. It is Paul in the midst of the Arapus or Mars Hill. He speaks to the elite of the city of Athens. He speaks to the intellectual capital of the Roman Empire. He attempts to present the intellectual and the philosophical legacy of the movement of the Jesus followers. This is his chance to make his case for Jesus. Recognize how bold a statement this is to make in the very place where it had been the home of both Socrates and Plato. Here, Paul stands toe to toe with the most sophisticated thinkers and intellectual skeptics in the Mediterranean world. That is the setting. Now think about the message that he is to transpire, the gospel. He has been preaching it in simple enough form that unlearned fishermen in Galilee can comprehend and share it. But here it must be mentally stimulating enough for the lovers of Greek literature and philosophy and discourse to appreciate. Listen for how Paul politely but boldly tells the erudite Athenians that they are ignorant. Note Paul is presenting his message to the, note that Paul in presenting his message will use assumptions of ignorance of Jesus, but he is also recognizing that these are the elite thinkers with their own established beliefs that he wants to change. With that context, Acts chapter 17, 22 through 31. Paul stood in front of the Aeropost, Aerop yeah, Mars Hill, and said, Athenians, I see how extremely spiritual you are in every way. For I went through your, the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship. I found among them an altar with the inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it. He who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all peoples to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of their places where they would live. So they would search for God and perhaps fumble about for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, even as even some of your poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that, uh, that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an imagined form by the, by the art and imagination of mortals. While God was overlooked, has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day in which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Paul arrived in Athens and carefully scoped out the place. 
did the tourist sort of thing. He was seeing many, many objects of worship all around the town. Now, even in modern times, the Athenians were not, are not alone in their path or this way of worship. Some years back, Yvonne and I had the uh, pleasure of doing an exchange program with a very small university in Japan. As part of the trip, we got to ride the bullet train, that very, very fast, very comfortable train. That was fun. We also had a, a comfortable visit, partially because of a delightful young Japanese woman was our guide. She was, I think, a graduate student at one university and teaching English at this other university. She took us to Kyoto, an ancient capital city. And yes, it had a wonderful, interesting, many centuries old, huge fort, now a museum. But what I think really stuck with me was the number and variety of shrines. Shinto, literally means the way of the gods, is Japan's native belief system and predates historic records. The overriding belief is in Shinto is to is promoting harmony and purity in all aspects of life. Humans are thought of as being fundamentally good and evil is caused by evil spirits. Therefore, they put shrines everywhere. The purpose of Shinto, therefore, is to pray and make offerings to the kami to keep away the evil spirits. And there are shrines, large and small, all over the place, even out in the neighborhoods. I reached my limit on what I could handle with shrines. Our guide stopped unexpectedly at one small shrine, and I think she may have said some sort of prayer and made a donation. We scurried up our courage and asked her why that particular one. It turns out it was one that was supposed to protect your good fortune in taking exams. <laughs> I, ho I hope it worked for her, I really do. In any event, I think one of the main observations was how similar this belief system may well have been to Paul's experience 2,000 years earlier when he visited Athens. Okay, now visualize Paul, the former highly esteemed Jewish scholar, one who in last week's reading as a young man stood by and watched, if not applauded, the stoning of Stephen. One who has had a conversion experience on the Damascus road like no other. Here, Paul the evangelist is with his, his, has his opportunity to address the leading minds of the day. It behooves us to spend a little time looking at his message and even some of his strategy in presenting that message as we try and sharpen our own evangelism techniques. Jeremy Williams points out that there are, are a few admirable points in Paul's engagement with the Athenians, and there are some that are dangerous, especially dangerous if people emulate without adaptation Paul's perspectives in contemporary times. However, Paul shows particularly good teaching technique in paying attention to what matters to the Athenians in their experience. He observes their practices, starts with where they are, and in his message, he even quotes their poetry. He demonstrates he is knowledgeable, that he is worthy of their attention, <clears throat> yet he does not compromise his message. Paul starts by noting the religiosity of the Athenians. He has been touring their city, he tells him, and I've seen all your shrines. If you stop there, it sounds almost like a compliment. It's not. I've been observing all these statues, he says, but I even found one to the unknown God. Paul's statement about the Athenians worship practice will turn quickly into a pejorative. It would not, 
it would not be unfair to translate his statement as saying that the Athenians are very superstitious and in an unflattering way. They are so far off, according to him, that they even worship what they do not know. He then uses this God of the unknown as an entry point to launch into his real message. The remainder of his speech, stepping carefully into their own confession of ignorance, that is worshiping an unknown God, Paul offers to make known to them what has been unknown. Remember, he wants to win them over, not just defeat them in debate or make them mad. He is, it's like he's saying, here, I'm here to introduce you to this God so that you can worship intelligently and know who you are dealing with. However, also note here, he starts with a story from history. Note that he does not start, as he would with his Jewish colleagues, with a story about Jesus or even a story about Abraham, like he would have with a particularly Jewish audience. His best hope to capture this audience in Athens is to focus on the creative, creational work of God. He proclaims God as the source and sustainer of all it is, and those who, whom no human construct could contain. Even as he begins to speak of what Israel know, has known of God, Paul emphasizes that this God has already gifted the listening Athenians with something near and dear to them, life and breath itself. God was personal for them. God had given each person their own time and place to dwell. This audience, which placed high value on intellectual argument, undoubtedly appreciated a God who put them in this place and gave them such a rich and pleasant life. Paul argues they, have, have, they may have, in the past search for God, perhaps fumbled for him and attempted to find a God. What he argues is they may have indeed made at least an incidental contact with a divine God, it's so close, and because God is so close. Again, understanding his audience, Paul chooses as his proof, not a passage from the Hebrew scriptures, but the words from a Greek poet who describes God as the one whom, quote, we live and move and have our being, and for we too are his offspring. Since they have their origin within God, Paul argues that this God who bore them must not be conceived as a work of human hands or even inventive minds or conceived, conceived as a living being or worshiped as a statue. Paul says to have, they have no need to imagine that the divine being is like gold and, or silver or stone images made by human skill and thought. There is no need for an image formed by art or imagination or mortal, of mortals, no need for shrines or idols. Well, after laying all this foundation, not until then, does Paul make any specific Christian claim. Now he selects the most Christian of Christian claims. He asserts that this God has appointed a just judge who will clar clarify what has been unknown to the hearers. This appointment, appointed one can be trusted because God has raised him from the dead. Furthermore, he tells them, while God has overlooked the time of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Paul makes clear his own apocalyptic vision and stressing God has fixed the day of judgment by Jesus, and this has been assured by his resurrection. 
then as now, the solution embedded in Paul's message for those who do not yet see God and do not yet treat others as divine siblings is to repent. Then as now, repentance refers to change in mind to accept God, which leads to change in behavior. Paul's message is that humans must change their minds because God has selected the resurrected Jesus as the one who will judge people by the standards of justice. Doing justice is setting the bar. The guarantee that one can trust the justice of God is based on how God responded to Jesus, the just one. Jesus, who was executed unjustly. Jesus, who God raised from the dead. The unknown God made known through the resurrection of the Son. Now, those among us who look at strategy or argument or teaching strategy would note that Paul was wise in setting aside his own opinions about what he found offensive in the Athenians' brief belief and practice. We can appreciate the ways Paul attempted to meet the Athenians where they are within their own spiritual practices. We can even applaud his decision to begin with recognition of a shared origin in God. We can learn from his adjustment to speak in ways that are different than when we are speaking to those of our own community. Then he has the courage to reveal Christ standing on common ground. He offers the new life in Christ to those willing listeners. He nudges them in the right direction by letting them know we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone or imagine an image formed by art and imagination of mortals. At that point, Paul's time is up and he has to leave. We learn from the next paragraph about the results. Some scoffed, some were open to learning more, and some of them joined him and became believers. Now for us, let us be inspired by Paul as a model for our own evangelism and risk-taking. We, like Paul, we and the Holy Spirit with us, can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of them and make our best argument. Then entrust them to God, who may bring to fulfillment the doors we have opened up. Yes, some will scoff, some will want to know more, and some will become believers. As we are called to do, we, like Paul, take risks to share our own faith with others. And in the end, God will be praised. Amen. Let us share our first hymn this morning, Ye Servants of God. 